The Nature of Gothic Gothic is an international art style, systematic process, and whole world view that dominated the medieval world. To dispel any illusions, when the word Gothic is used in literary circles, such as stories about the darkened halls of Northanger Abbey or the macabre reanimations of Frankenstein, it is not referring to this Gothic style, more a shallow reflection of what it truly stood for. The Romantic Gothic is atheistic, scientific, and generally gloomy, which is an anathema to what the Gothic mind believed in. The origin of the name Gothic is, as many names are, intended as an insult, but ultimately adopted and embraced. The earliest references are between Raphael and Pope Leo X, where the young master refers to the art descending down from the Alps as rough and barbarian-like and links it to the historic and disastrous invasion from the north by the roaming barbarian tribes of the Goths. When people think about Gothic, they may think of dark and gloomy cloisters filled with chanting monks. While there is an element of this, it's an artistic period that spans a huge period of time and balances the darkness with a vibrant joviality that is unique. One aspect of this miscasting of the Gothic as all doom and gloom, is not understanding that it has a huge part in the Renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth, and this period is associated with a massive cultural flowering. But what has been reborn? Some historians would say that it is a rebirth in classical ideas and art. Now, while this is true to a degree, certainly the high Renaissance in the 16th century was dominated by classical styles and subjects, but for much of the earlier parts, the Gothic style dominates. Raphael, in these infamous letters, is writing in 1518, so we've already had some of the great masters of the Northern Renaissance, with Jan van Eyck, Hieronymus Bosch, and a plethora of others, guiding culture for a hundred years. What we see in the Renaissance period is two veins of culture, the Gothic and the Classical, the North and the South, struggling for cultural hegemony. The Gothic style of painting continued well past Raphael's death, in 1520 in the north, but in Italy it was pretty much stamped out, and ultimately classicism destroyed the Gothic. You can see this process of stylistic replacement happening live in the artist of the time. Giovanni Bellini, who was brother-in-law to Mantegna, began with strong Gothic influences, such as his painting, The Agony in the Garden, but as his life continued, we see he was continually influenced by Florentine classicism. In The Transfiguration of Christ, we still have the detail of the Gothic landscapes, but the figures are in classical draping robes. Elijah stands to the right using contraposte and the strong elements of symmetry. Gothic by and large ends by the 16th century, but when did it start? Again, this is hard to understand, particularly because as we go back in time, we have less artifacts, less information about the practice of art, and certainly no Vasari giving us detailed biographies about the most relevant people. What we do see is a number of cultural items. Most is what we would describe today as craft rather than fine art, originating in the Germanic West, with epicenters in Germany, France, the Netherlands, Northern Italy, Spain, and England from the 11th century onward. As Reynolds says, nothing comes from nothing. As humans, we need that spark from historical culture to set the soul on fire for the culture of today. And in that way, there are two cultural roots that the Gothic draws from. Some artistic works pull from the cultural traditions of their forefathers, while others ape existing cultures with strong influences at the time, such as the Eastern Romans. From an architectural viewpoint in the West, Celtic culture was soon supplanted by the Roman classical. But with the Germanic invasions wiping that cultural identity away, many classical forms were abandoned. As these invaders settled and consolidated their power, they wanted to draw from the authorities of the past and present, fusing the Eastern Roman with classicism ultimately creating the Romanesque. This influence from the Eastern Romans has long been neglected, but without the sharing of their skills and techniques, the West would be nothing. This is the Torah church, which resides outside the walls of Constantinople, and whose main external features were made around 1080 AD. From the front, we can see the simple curved arches and Byzantine domes. Around the back, however, we can see a dramatic flying buttress, curved apse, and recessed Roman arches. If we compare this to a Romanesque church such as the Eglise Saint-Pierre de Chauvigny, yes, the rustic red bricks have been replaced by the smooth local stone, but the Eastern Roman features are there. Why then does the Romanesque fall to the Gothic? While this is a complicated and disparate answer, I think we can see it as a form of cultural confidence created by a strengthened church from wealth gained from the collapse of the Eastern Roman Empire and the creative fruition of hundreds of years of artistic endeavour. And so, we can identify the Gothic period from the 12th to the 16th century, 
but there has been great confusion as to what is the quintessential nature of Gothic itself. What makes up a Gothic building? John Ruskin, the Victorian artist, thinker and critic, was a bright light in his age, and someone who delved deep into answering these questions. Writing in 1851, the Victorians had been through two periods of Gothic revival, which at that time were not that well received. Ruskin, as a lover of all things medieval, was captivated by the Gothic period buildings of Venice, and decided to use the buildings around Venice as a timeline for the development of different architecture. He spent four years researching and writing his triple book, The Stones of Venice. In it, Ruskin attempts to show the developments of the buildings in Venice, and use this discourse as a platform for further artistic discussions. In the second book of Stones, he tries to lay out what he identifies what the Gothic mindset is, and what features make up a Gothic building. This chapter went on to be recognised as hugely important for its discussions on the Gothic, but also the artistic spirit that has been lost with classicism. The arts and crafts movement would be guided by many of the principles laid out in this chapter, and it affected William Morris so much that he made a print run of the chapter as part of his Kelmscott Press. Having read and reread this chapter over several years, I've pulled out what I think the main arguments that Ruskin brings forward when he tries to identify Gothic features and the Gothic mindset. Gothic features. When we analyse the style of a building, we very much take a book by its cover, combing over its surface for clues as to its provenance. Ruskin, through his extensive knowledge of European architecture and this focus study in Venice, identifies several features that occur in Gothic buildings. The Gothic arch. We saw in the Chora church an emphasis on the curved. The domed roof and the curved Roman arch all have this underlying circular nature to them, but the Gothic evolves this curved shape into the Gothic arch. The Gothic arch will be instantly familiar to the viewer, with the curve giving way to a point at its centre. Ruskin is swift to point out that it is technically not an arch but merely a curved gable. He thinks that its design is derived from the Gothic stonemasons testing the strength of arches and finding this shape to be the most suitable for the transference of load. The Gothic arch is in fact a technical innovation rather than an ornamental one, a bait, one that was then ornamented. The Flying Buttress a buttress, in layman's terms, is a support for a wall. Imagine you have a building with two long and very high walls, just like in a cathedral nave, and place a large arched roof at the top. You will have a lot of downward force, but due to the way that the arch passes force down, you will end up with a large amount of horizontal force, pushing the walls out. The buttress prevents the walls from falling out this way, but they are large and unwieldy, making getting around the building very hard and restricting the light from entering in the large windows of the church. The solution to this is the flying buttress, which combines a buttress and an arch, giving the wall the support it needs while allowing light through. We've seen how the flying buttress is actually a very old innovation, but one that was adopted widely within the Gothic period, who not only use it on a large scale, but also place flying buttresses on buttresses. The pinnacle. The architectural pinnacle, from which our vernacular usage of the word derives, are the large pointing objects that seem to randomly sit on the top of various parts of cathedrals. As with everything mentioned so far, their usage was originally functional. Pinnacles would often be lined with additional weight, giving more structural force downwards, in turn helping support buttresses and walls. Over time, pinnacles would become an important focal point of ornamentation, not only creating bold vertical lines for buildings, but also offering the opportunity to include recessed arches and statues. The niche. The niche is an architectural feature which allowed for the protection of a statue or holy relic in the face of a wall. This feature is derived from Imperial Rome, where statues of famous men and the gods would be stored, protecting the precious statues from the elements. Once again, in the hands of the Gothic stonemason, the niche's usage was evolved. The gods were replaced by saints and kings, and they were ornamented both structurally and also in some cases in paint. You can get a glimpse of what that would have originally looked like by looking at the Minstrel's Gallery in Exeter Cathedral, which has tried to recreate the vibrant colours of the past. One of my favourite uses of the niche is in the face of that same Exeter Cathedral. Here the wall has almost dissolved away, and there is only niche, body after body, piled on top of each other. The vaulted ceiling. The vaulted ceiling is a feature that marks some of the greatest engineering and craftsmanship of the late Gothic period. King's College Chapel in Cambridge had its foundation stone laid in 1441, with the architect being Henry VI's master mason, Reginald Ely, with the main structure being finished by 1515. One of its most notable features is its impressively ornamented ceiling, which seems to be pulled up from the floor and fires out on all sides connecting at the centre. 
This feature originates in the simple problem of putting a load across four walls. There are a number of ways to achieve this, using large wooden struts to span the distance, for example, or if you have a square floor plan, you can use a dome or series of domes. But for the rectangular shape that marks the Gothic Cathedral, a vault is superior in technical strength. There are a few variations, with the groin and rib vault being the most common. This, for example, was the ceiling in Notre Dame before it was set aflame, and is a rib vault. The fan vault is said to have originated in Gloucester in around 1350, and I think it's one of the most singularly beautiful Gothic feature, combining engineering prowess, ornamental beauty, and a sense of something truly holy and transcendent. Stained glass. Stained glass, in our modern imagination, will be forever tied to the Gothic period. This is an art form like none other, offering a unique fusion of light and colour to raise the passions to new heights. Stained glass in the form we see in the Gothic period is a feature that does seem to be unique, with only single coloured glass being used before. Stained glass solves three problems. How does one fill the large spaces created by the dramatic arches of the cathedral? How can we turn internal spaces into places of colour as well as shadow? And finally, with the removal of much wall space, I can tell the stories of our ancestors without fresco. The lead which binds the stained glass together allows the creation of a window of a span much larger than could be otherwise created by the technology of that time in a single sheet. This example is the Great East Window in York Minster, which, when created in 1405, was the largest expanse of stained glass in Britain. With it are some of the most beautiful depictions of English medieval art. Here we have John receiving the little scroll from the angel in the apocalypse. He is kneeling to prepare himself to bind up what the seven thunders have spoken. There are two sets of paired colour, the white and the red and the yellow and the blue, the lead lines of the glass acting as both border to objects such as the angel wings but also creating folds in John's robes and texture in the background. The tower. While one may not think it, Ruskin refers to the tower as being associated with the Gothic. While other civilizations used them to a degree, it was never to the same extent as the medieval period. The tower begins its life as a defensive object outside of town, before being taken into the centre of towns and being made from brick. A great example is St Mark's Campanile, which is a standalone tower built in the centre of St Mark's Square, with its foundations being laid, 901. This standalone tower starts to merge with the church at the end of the Romanesque period, with another Italian example being San Michele in Foro, rebuilt in 1707, with the facade being from the 13th century. This church is partly Romanesque, partly Gothic you can see the almost awkward tower starting to merge into the main body of the church. While not fully integrated, there is an umbilical connection between the buildings. Gothic buildings with towers integrated are quite commonplace, and can be seen in Notre Dame, Westminster Abbey, and Canterbury Cathedral, which is displayed here. The Column The Column is something that has been used for many generations, from the Egyptian Temple of Karnak to the Minoan Palace in Crete, through to the Greeks, Romans, and into the West. Classical columns are usually classed into one of several orders, based on their style. Column consists of three major parts. The base, which is the platform it stands on, the shaft, the length of material, making the bulk of the column, and the capital, the top part which is frequently ornamented. You can see how each of the orders of classical column vary in all three of these areas. The Eastern Romans take the classical column, abandon most orders apart from the Corinthian and composite, and add a new type of capital. Rather than the recurved shape of the Corinthian, it becomes something heavier, like a wide U or V. This is a capital from a museum in Cyprus that I found, which gives a nice example of this. Ruskin also gives us a nice selection which are all hand drawn by him from Venice and printed in stones. Note how, rather than a fixed format, the capital is wildly different both in terms of pattern, design and shape, when compared to the early Roman columns. The Gothic mind takes this further and attempts to fuse these designs with figurative art. Here, both animals and humans are incorporated into the column. In this example, we can see two small capitals, from the Basilique de saint reine in Toulouse. The left column looks like a biblical story, maybe an angel leading Adam and Eve out of paradise after the fall. And the right-hand column shows us two cows, or maybe lions, angrily looking behind themselves in perfect symmetry while a grotesque head flies above them and wraps its tentacles around them. From the classical to gothic, we've gone from rigid purity to eclectic narrative art. Feature summary. There are several features Ruskin establishes that are associated with gothic architecture. But as we've seen, many of them do not truly spring out of the medieval period, but are adaptations of existing features. 
The other problem we have in trying to mark out the Gothic from the Romanesque is that buildings may only have a few features listed above. A great example is Saint Michel in Foro that we saw above. We can see that from its face, it's a building that looks Romanesque at first glance, with many Roman curved arches and a building plan that is of an old Roman temple. However, on closer inspection, the facade features hundreds of columns and capitals, undeniably Gothic in style, each wildly varied with intricacies from the Gothic fancy. Is this a Romanesque or a Gothic building? Ruskin himself notes this, every building of the Gothic period differs in some important respect from every other, and many include features which, if they occurred in other buildings, would not be considered Gothic at all, so that all we have to reason upon is merely a greater or lesser degree of Gothicness in each building we examine. Ruskin, reflecting on these particulars, sensed that a building is not merely a collection of features which, through arbitrary checkboxes, achieve their goals, but are organic things created by the Gothic mind. Why is the Gothic column Gothic? Because it is made by the Gothic imagination, and contained within it is the true nature of Gothic. Ruskin maps out what he describes as the characteristics or moral elements of Gothic. They are savageness or rudeness, changefulness or love of change, naturalism or love of nature, grotesqueness, the disturbed imagination, rigidity or obstinacy, Redundance, or generosity. Rudeness. Now, rudeness obviously doesn't mean that the buildings were insulting to passers-by, but rather they contained a roughness of character that was distinctly North European. It is a non-flamboyant, brutal, and yielding quality that makes a Gothic building instantly identifiable. Ruskin ties this quality to the land of the North, noting that, as the craftsmen pulled from nature, they took in the signs and symbols of their surroundings, and absorb the rudeness of their land into their work. Quote, Let us contrast their delicacy and brilliance of colour and swiftness of motion with the frost-cramped strength and shaggy covering and dusky plumage of the northern tribes. Contrast the Arabian horse with the Shetland, the tiger and leopard with the wolf and the bear, the antelope with the elk, the bird of paradise with the osprey, and then submissively acknowledge the great laws by which the earth and all that it bears are ruled throughout their being. Let us not condemn, but rejoice at the expression by man of his own rest in the statutes of the lands that give him birth. This rudeness manifests itself in a number of ways, but we can get an idea of this unyielding quality by comparing the Pantheon with the face of the world's cathedral. The Pantheon is bold with its huge columns giving a sense of epic scale, but at the same time it has a sense of lightness and openness. The colonnade is beckoning you to come inside the building. Wells Cathedral is the opposite of this. It is channeling the spirit of God which says, I am. It is huge and imposing, like a fortress of spirituality. Rather than letting anyone in, there are a series of small doors. It is the narrow path. It is not for all, but for the elect. Another element to this is in understanding how perfection is treated. Specifically, the classicist who only accepts perfection versus the Gothic that aims for perfection but accepts his ultimate failure. The classical spirit seeks to find the most perfect person or the most perfect form, but in their quest for perfection they will always fail. Ruskin has two arguments for the importance of imperfection. Quote, no good work whatever can be perfect, and the demand for perfection is always a sign of a misunderstanding of the ends of art. To be clear, the Gothic mind does not aim for imperfection, but he does not demand perfection either. Ruskin goes on, No great man ever stops working till he has reached his point of failure. That is to say, his mind is always far in advance of his powers of execution, and the latter will now and then give way in trying to follow it. According to his greatness, he becomes so accustomed to the feelings of dissatisfaction with the best he can do, that in moments of lassitude or anger with himself, he will not care though the beholder be dissatisfied also. You can see this idea being borne out when looking at architectural columns. There is a reason why there are only a few orders of classical column. The stonemason, being commissioned by a master, seeking perfection, spends his life repeating the same design over and over, but he never dares to create something new, for all new forms require refinement and work, not just in the life of a single artist, but many. Demand for perfection, therefore, is a mental cage, preventing the organic growth of a culture. The rude-minded Gothic artist is constantly growing his art, working and failing in a permanent state of struggle, but that Christian craftsman would think back to the word, we glory in tribulations also, 
knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. His second argument is in highlighting the imperfection of nature. Imperfection is in some sort essential to all we know of life. Nothing that lives is, or can be, rigidly perfect. Part of it is decaying, part nascent, and in all things that live, there are certain irregularities and deficiencies, which are not only signs of life, but sources of beauty. The Stoic mind seeks to remove the passions, the classical to remove the imperfections, but in doing so, they remove the vitality of life itself, and a great source of beauty. Changefulness. Ruskin begins thus, I have already enforced the allowing independent operation to the inferior workman, simply as a duty to him, as ennobling the architecture by rendering it more Christian. We have now to consider what reward we obtain for the performance of this duty, namely, the perpetual variety of every feature of the building. Wherever the workman is utterly enslaved, the parts of the building must of course be absolutely like each other, for the perfection of his execution can only be reached by exercising him in doing one thing and giving him nothing else to do. Ruskin here is talking about the fundamental principles behind different kinds of architecture. Should a building be something that is purely dictated from above, with a godlike architect commanding every single detail to be completed in the manner of his choosing? Conversely, should the hundreds of inferior, that is, lower ranked, stonemasons have some creative input in the design? In the Gothic mind, while there is a clear collective vision for the building, individuals are given the authority to have some personal impact. This is the reason that we have a huge variety of column capitals in Gothic work. In general, each stonemason of a certain level was relied upon to do his best in his small part of the whole. This notion is very much like the great chain of being, implemented at an architectural level. Ruskin reinforces the value of changefulness by comparing it to other artistic types. Great art, whether expressing itself in words, colours or stones, does not say the same thing over and over again. That the merit of architectural, as of every other art, consists in its saying new and different things. That to repeat itself is no more a characteristic of genius in marble than it is of genius in print. And that we may, without offending any laws of good taste, require of an architect, as we do of a novelist, that he should not only be correct, but entertaining. Naturalism. Ruskin defines this as follows. The third constituent element of the Gothic mind was stated to be naturalism. That is to say, the love of natural objects for their own sake, and the efforts to represent them frankly unconstrained by artistical laws. Naturalism is how nature is woven in to the fabric of the artistic work. The classic mind seeks to dominate nature, to remove reality and bend it to its will. The example that he references is in the use of the acanthus in Roman capitals. This picture is of a composite column capital, and you can see the leaf being used in a rather abstract way to create a sense of symmetrical balance. But in doing this, they have moved far away from the original leaf. Look how it compares to a natural leaf. How the leaf drapes down, how it contains a vitality that is lost in the sculpture. You can see this removal of vitality time and time again when looking at the depiction of nature in classical art. Another example of this is the Roman carved fruit garland, here seen on a sarcophagus. Again, it suffers from the fact that its form has been purified to make it symmetrical. If you compare it to a fruit garland from one of Crivelli's Madonnas, we can see the Roman roots of it, but it has a distinctly Gothic twist. There is an element of symmetry, but it's broken up by the leaf position and the swapping of an apple with a huge, ridiculous cucumber. Ruskin summarises well. Both Greek and Roman use conventional foliage in their ornament, passing into something that was not foliage at all, knotting itself into strange cup-like buds or clusters, and growing out of lifeless rods instead of stems. The Gothic sculptor received these types at first as things that ought to be, just as we have a second time received them, but he could not rest in them. He saw that there was no veracity in them, no knowledge, no vitality. Do what he would, he could not help liking the true leaves better, and cautiously, a little at a time, he put more of nature into his work, until at last it was all true, retaining, nevertheless, every valuable character of the original, well-disciplined and designed arrangement. The Grotesque This is, quote, the tendency to delight 
in fantastic and ludicrous, as well as in sublime images, is a universal instinct of the Gothic imagination. Grotesqueness is what I think is the most misunderstood aspect of the Gothic mind. People often conflate it with horror, but grotesqueness is more than mere violence. It is something deeply out of place, best described as a product of the disturbed imagination. Ruskin gives us more detail. It seems to me that the grotesque is, in almost all cases, composed of two elements, one ludicrous, the other fearful, that, as one or other of these elements prevail, the grotesqueness falls into two branches, sportive grotesque and terrible grotesque, but that we cannot legitimately consider it under these two aspects, because there are hardly any examples which do not in some degree combine both elements. You can see these two elements of the grotesque at play in many different settings. On the top of the Notre Dame are the famous gargoyles. This example on the left shows us the sport of nature that Ruskin describes. Rather than the fearsome gargoyle, we might be expecting to see guard the church from cruel spirits. We can see him resting on his arms and sticking out his tongue, the whole of Paris far below. Other gargoyles are more fearsome, such as the one on the right, which seems to have the arms of a wolf, the horns of a goat, and hairy legs, but it still contains a humorous element. This next example is an almost meta grotesque from one of the capital of Wells Cathedral. It shows what looks like a hooded pilgrim who has been walking without shoes and is pulling a thorn out his foot. This experience would have been commonplace to the pilgrim traveller that would frequent the hallowed halls of the cathedral, and would no doubt raise a laugh from a band of weary walkers at the climax of their travels. The sport of grotesque is humorous, but something that reflects the lives of the people the building serves. Most of all it reminds us of death, the inevitable path for all gazing upon these unsettling creations. This is emphasised in the last grotesque from York Minster. Here, a smiling king smugly looks down at the peasants below, that is, us, but he is unaware of the fearsome creature that clings onto his crown. One day justice will be given to the servants of that laughing king. Rigidity. We come to the penultimate definition, and this one not as straightforward as the others. When we heard the word rigidity, we think of something strong, immovable, but Ruskin marks out this characteristic as something more nuanced. I mean, not merely stable, but active rigidity, the peculiar energy which gives tension to movement and stiffness to resistance, which makes the fiercest lightning forked rather than curved, and the stoutest oak branch angular rather than bending, and is as much seen in the quivering of the lance as in the glittering of the icicle. To see this in life, let's look at the stout oak that he talks about. We can see the angular arms that have a sense of energy in the act of supporting the heavy load of leads above them. There is a general sense of tension and strength across the tree. Where I think we can see this best applied is in comparing the Gothic to the French Art Nouveau. The French and Belgian strains of the art style that arrives in the last part of the 19th century is heavily influenced by nature, but often it pulls in its more whimsical and flaccid elements. This is an example shop face from an Art Nouveau building in Belgium. We can see soft curves and smoke-like tendrils emanate up from the ground, delicately. The interior of Wells Cathedral contains a large arch at the end of its nave, and is known as the St Andrew's Cross. This cross has that oak-like strength we saw above, but also contains an active energy, making it seem alive. Ruskin picks up on this connection to the living. In the Gothic vaults and traceries, there is a stiffness analogous to that of the bones of a limb or fibres of a tree, an elastic tension and communication of force from part to part, and also a studious expression of this throughout every visible line of the building. Again, Ruskin ties this back to the national spirit of the northern tribes. The necessities consequent upon the employment of a rougher material, compelling the workman to seek for vigour of effort, rather than the refinement of texture or accuracy of form. Strength of will, independence of character, Resoluteness of purpose, impatience of undue control, and that general tendency to set the individual reason against authority, and the individual deed against destiny, which, in the northern tribes, has opposed itself throughout all ages to the languid submission in the southern of thought to tradition and purpose to fatality, are all more or less traceable in the rigid lines, vigorous and various masses, the daring projection an independent structure of the northern gothic ornament. Ruskin concludes with a warning that while this is the most gothic of impulses, it is easy to misuse and, quote, like the great puritan spirit in the extreme, lose itself in frivolity of division or perversity of purpose. Redundance. 
Redundance is the hardest element to understand, with Ruskin leaving us this vague explanation. Quote, the uncalculating bestowal of the wealth of its labour. Ruskin is quick to place this as the least important characteristic as well. After reading around some Victorian dictionaries, there are some words which I think may help explain a little more. These are superfluous or overplus, but they don't quite hit the mark of what Ruskin is thinking here. Maybe a better way to put it would be, redundance is the visual effect garnered by a mass of ornamental, visible work. Rather than less is more, more is more. To help explain this, imagine a scene. Walking along a country lane and passing by the English countryside, we spy a wild hedgerow. Purple heads of thistles dot its base, and thick thorns rip through the spiked hawthorn which makes the bulk of the hedge while small birds weave themselves through various twiggy walkways. There is so much going on, different leaf types, colours and shapes massed together. If an artist was to try and paint something with these base elements, he would struggle. But when viewed on a brisk spring day in this humble hedge, we can but marvel. When we say the word superfluous, we think over the top, unnecessary, and maybe even extravagant. Ruskin sees this differently. That humility, which is the very life of the Gothic school, not only in the imperfection, but to the accumulation of ornament. The inferior rank of the workman is often shown as much in the richness as the roughness of his work. And if the cooperation of every hand and the sympathy of every heart are to be received, then we must be content to allow the redundance which disguises the failure of the feeble and wins the regard of the inattentive. Gothic over-ornamentation as a form of humility is quite the inversion of many modern ideas, but it is based on reason. For Ruskin sets out that the inferior craftsman has value in mass. By over-ornamenting, it creates something larger than the sum of its parts. The Gothic is an art style much maligned, misunderstood, and a centre of prestige throughout the years. At its face value, it presents itself as a number of identifiable features, but on closer inspection, it is clearly not merely physical, but a vital impulse that runs through the heart of these buildings. This Gothic imagination is one unlike any other that has been in history, one of a deep connection to God and to the natural world. It is a culture of paradox, one which fuses the dark with the light, the jolly with the terrible, the superfluous with the humble. When we walk in the shadows long cast by these great buildings, let us remember our ancestors, who, through their struggle with imperfection, produced works that resonate through time and contain within them the nature of Gothic.